So I volunteered on an organic farm, and I never left. So um, 22 years, I've run my own farm, and uh, from the very beginning, I came with an uh, environmental steward background. And uh, one thing that agriculture is not known as is being good environmental stewards or using resources wisely. Um, uh, early on, um, I just uh, did what everybody else did, but very quickly realized that um, uh, by using uh, certain practices that are age old, um, I could not only uh, grow a better product, um, but I could do it uh, cheaper uh, with less resources. So the first thing I really started with was these peaches that you guys had today. And what I do in the peach orchard is um, I create a dust mulch. I grow my cover crop every winter when there's water abundant. Okay, I, I grow it up to you know my armpit if I can. Um, and then I, I cultivate it under, um, I let it decompose in the soil, and then I create something with the last rain of the springtime, I create a dust mulch. So it's about six inches of light, fluffy soil. I don't let a dog go in there. I don't walk in there for about a month. I let it dry out just a little on top so when you do walk on it, um, what's happening in the soil is you have your, your water table, you know, basically a lake underwater, and then um, it wicks up to the surface. In the field, when you don't have that dust mulch and you have roots going down, water wicks up to the surface and that top molecule evaporates and capillary action just brings all the rest of the water up to the surface and it evaporates either through uh, the leaf of a plant or right through the, the soil surface. So by creating this dust mulch, I'm leaving all that water right in the soil. So, um, so you, you break the capillary. I break the capillary action. So whether it's a, a, a you know, pea gravel or in my case, see, um, a part of our farm is a 60 tree test orchard uh, where I started, I, um, I started with the dust mulch and then I transitioned into wood chips. And then I realized I, I do about uh, 1,600 trees right now. It's, that's what one person can trim in a, in a winter, is how many trees I have. Um, so uh, um, so we, I then started throwing wood chips and realized that even in a place as abundant in wood and wood chips as this, 60 trees is, is an impossible amount of wood to spread every winter. So I wanted to reduce my petroleum use, even though it was a rototiller once or twice in the springtime, I wanted to reduce that to zero. Um, uh, and I still wanted to have my water use at zero, okay? So I didn't want to mow a lawn. I didn't want to use my rototiller. How am I going to accomplish this? So I started doing a living mulch. Um, that's worked to some degree. My, my vigor isn't the same. Uh, and I haven't transferred what I've learned from that out to my larger orchard. But it is something I continue to work with. It's really interesting that I actually see I need more fertility in that space, possibly because I'm not cover cropping it. I've got a living mulch. Um, but uh, it's something, um, you know, I have peaches from early June to mid-October. Um, I've, since growing the peaches, also you have to realize that this site is not ideal. I'm not on class one ag soil. I'm on a, a knoll. Uh, the, the ground slopes on all sides from my orchard. Um, it's not bottomless. Um, uh, it's 106 degrees there um, today uh, and yesterday and the day before. Okay, so it's it's not ideal, um, and you can still see it. Okay, but one of the interesting things is that because I'm not out mowing my strips of green in between my trees, uh, that's you know tractors that aren't being used. Uh, that's also when you water on a farm, a lot of times you're going to burn through the organic matter in your soil, and you're going to uh, uh, you're going to burn through your nutrients, and so you're going to need supplemental your er, supplemental fertility. So you're going to need to be putting things into your irrigation water um, or uh, maybe foliar spraying. Um, uh, I don't have to do any of that. I've got a super high organic content in my soil, which helps me with my water holding capacity. And um, I just watch the trees. The trees must tell me everything. I have uh, fertilized, other than my cover crop, I have fertilized once in 22 years. That was last year. I felt guilty, um, <laughs> even though this is my average size peach. I was feeling guilty, and uh, according to organic standards, I need to be putting some inputs in because I am putting, taking inputs out. And even though I looked at my landscape and I was like, what else is happening here? Other than my cover crop, what else is coming in here? 
And so I, I, I think my, my sole input was, um, I was thinking robin poo, like bird. <laughs> that's like in the winter, we'll get so many robins eating worms out in our cover crop. So that's the only input I could really see coming in. And of course I'm joking, but it's like that's how. So, um, so I watch the trees, they're dark green, they're luscious. When a, when a peach is coming on, if a tree is stressed, it'll start yellowing, the leaves will yellow and fall. Um, none of my trees do that, they're dark green. It's amazing to watch, okay? Um, so from that, I've now, I, I dry farm melons, I, I dry farm you know, persimmons, I dry farm a lot of stuff. And uh, so, and I also, so I am now uh, you know, almost zero on my fertility, and what I did do on my fertility was, is I got my soil sample, um, and I put oyster shell, I put in azomite, which is an A to Z mineral mix, it's kind of like your multi multivitamin, but I didn't do the NPK. Uh, my my soil doesn't need that. You know, it's there. Um, People don't let them know. NPK. Yeah, NPK is basically um, you know, uh, your plant can grow to uh, its limiting nutrients. So if you, and usually in a soil, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are your limiting nutrients in soil. So most um, and also that's what a, a chemical factory. Uh, can produce and put in blue crystals that you dump into your irrigation water. And a lot of uh, ag fields I've seen, they'll get their 50 pound bag, they'll be doing their flood irrigation and they'll just dump it in the row and it'll go on its way. Or uh, There is an industrial ag outlet out in Willow Creek and they actually have these big blue barrels, dump a 50 pound sack in and just let the, let the drip irrigation water all day long. And when, when the when the color of the water isn't blue again, they dump another bag of, of fer fertilizer in there. And so it's NPK. And that's, you know, nitrogen is where you get your dark green, leafy growth. Phosphorus and potassium are more responsible for like fruit and flower, um, if you want to think of it that way. So uh, vegetative growth, flowering, and fruit. But um, so the, uh, uh, the neat thing about, you know, not using much water is uh, I currently produce 15 acres of fruits and vegetables. Uh, we sell 100% of it within 55 miles of the farm. Uh, only once in 22 years have we ever uh, gone outside of that. And part of that is because um, it tastes so good. Um, when you pick things the day before market, um, when you really have your self behind a product, um, it's easy to sell. I, my problem is I have to tell people, I'm sorry, I don't have any more. So when I started, I did 12 fun, or uh, 12 supermarkets. I did five farmers markets a week. Uh, now I do two supermarkets. I do two farmers markets a week, and um, you know, my income is, is satisfactory. You know, um, the uh, um, if we want to look at the pictures a little, um, can <coughs> most people look like you got the slides right? Yeah. The um, I remember in there. I have been perused. Uh, the first few are just. Uh, our fields, our orchards, um, row crops. The, the farm right now owns um, 86 acres. Um, yeah, most people know us through um, the farmer's market. So the first thing you see it, um, an hour before the farmer's market starts is people in line for peaches. It's a really beautiful thing. Um, the, uh, the, um, there's a lot more to the farm, though. Another thing that's neat that I think helps sell the produce is that everybody working behind the booth is also the people out in the field. So they really, they have this passion for it as well. We try and hire, the only people we hire and the only people you'll see in, in the photographs are people that want to farm in their future. So um, I could get cheaper labor, I could get people that come and go, um, but I want to train the next wave to do this. So it's, um, that's really important to us. And what is also my life, I am, I am, somewhat of a slave to my farm, so um, I work this morning, I'll work tonight, and um, I don't do many social engagements, but I, fortunately I love what I do with my life, but, um, so I have to surround myself, I have to employ good, friendly, interesting people <laughs> if I want to have an interesting life, so uh, we have a woman from Arizona this year, we have a woman from Ohio, it's, um, it can be beautiful, how do you pronounce that, Steve? Okay, yeah. So there's, um, there's a few pictures from the air of our farm. The group photo is, that's our four main workers this year uh, with the, uh, the, um, the favorite chicken of the year, Poop. 
Um, this is my crew from last year. I actually was uh, honored to have my cousin come work for us for two years. So that's great. Now she is co-owner in a restaurant in Arcata, Phoenix Cafe. Um, we also, if you look at that picture of um, people with the hose, one thing we do, that field is irrigated. It's, um, it's on drip irrigation. Uh, we figured out we use um, each one of those rows is 150 feet. We figured out that uh, um, each uh, row gets uh, six gallons of water a week. Um, mm. So that's like you know a half a cup per plant per week. We bury the drip underground. Um, one of the neatest things that I'm really proud of is that uh, 15 acre farm, we use the same amount of water as the average homeowner in Willow Creek. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so very, very little. If you look at these pictures, you'll see dry fields over to the side. You'll also see, like in this picture, I really like this picture because it shows a Hopi red dye amaranth on one side of us. It shows some sunflowers in the back. One thing we always try and do is have lots and lots of habitat. Um, the, uh, the next one, I, okay, so I am not, in, I don't do technology. And so this morning when I lost my whole presentation, uh, I called in my 25-year-old uh, uh, worker to help me put this together. And it's kind of funny because she put some of her pictures. In. <laughs> <laughs> so this next one is my wife and I. And I can't, one of the reasons I have my employees and my wife in here is this farm is not me. This farm is a lot of people. It may actually, and the first one starting with the customers, that's like, I started this because it felt so good to feed my community, and, and like, it's this beautiful, beautiful thing. So to start it out with the customers is really where it's at. The, um, this, is, uh, this is our, we have a great vineyard. We do an, uh, an acre of a family wine. And, um, you know, lots of people think dry farming, grapes, of course, and then they take it, no, and then what, the best grapes in the world, um, dry farm in France, you know, oh, of course, uh, people don't take it any further. Uh, so many, I dry farm carrots, and you're, how does that make sense? No, they're wonderful. They're 18 inches long. You don't need a fork to pull them out because the soil isn't compacted by the water. Um, so, yeah, so the... Uh, you know, around here, um, this is a uh, cover crop in the springtime. That's a flail mulcher behind it, so that'll actually grind it up because the, the cover crop is too thick and too big for me to get any other tool through it. So I have to grind it down to a frothy um, goo. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing. But you can see there, that's, you know, that's a four or five foot tall. Uh, and here is... Um, uh, this is me on the tractor, and you can see that the soil looks dry on the surface, but I'm running two rippers down it. This is me planting carrots, actually. Um, so I actually make the furrows that the carrots, I, I actually uh, tell the carrots exactly where to grow. Because if, if you tell, if you don't, the carrot's going to fork, and you're going to get these crazy little people carrots. So, but what this also does for you guys, it shows you that there's soil moisture right there. So um, what I'll do is... Um, I will actually, uh, in the springtime, till in my cover crop, uh, and then I will make these long mounds of soil. And what that's doing is, is down the middle, down deep in that mound, is moisture. Okay? So what I've done prior to this picture is I've taken my rototill. It's the only time I use a rototill on the farm is just for seed bed preparation. So I make a nice flat level surface, and then I plant my seed. And what that does is it exposes that moisture. So Yesterday, I planted my last wave of melons. Late July, I can, um, we haven't had rain since April, and I can, I can put that, that mound uh, level, and I can run my cedar out, and those melons will give us fruit in late October with no water whatsoever. So it's pretty neat. And, um, and this is just a hippie kid smoking weed, figuring a couple things out. You know, like anybody could do this. I, um, so this is also neat. This is an Alice Chalmers 1948 tractor. It is the only tractor ever made with a rear-mounted engine. Um, one of the neat things about that is it can be so easily converted to electric. So that's the next step for that one. It's a cultivating tractor. It doesn't need a lot of horsepower. Friends of mine have done it. They get uh, with five heat cycle marine batteries. They get eight hours of quiet cultivation. It's beautiful because the tool is actually in between the front and the rear tires. So um, you can make micro adjustments and get perfect, perfect tillage. So it uh, saves a lot of time, a lot of energy. And, uh, and I, I particularly like this picture because 
it was, a, it was one of those days where I did my cultivation, I jumped off the tractor and I ran to do something else. Well, I didn't get back on it for the rest of the year. And you can see there's actually melons growing up. Th th those are melon plants growing up the, uh, the tires. So it's being consumed. And sure enough, we actually did pick some melons that were hanging off the track. Also, another water conservation tactic is the background. That, uh, that is shade cloth, 30% shade cloth. It allows us to grow heirloom tomatoes and use, once again, six gallons per 150-foot row per week. A question? I want to ask, do you feel that this, this is translatable to the Central Valley? Yeah, totally. Um, I did a, I gave a similar presentation about dry farming at the Small Farmers Conference in Oregon this year. And basically, some of the scientists that were there presenting with me said, if you had four, four inches of topsoil, and if you get any amount of saturation any time in the year, this is possible. And it's basically the same tactic, tactics of capturing that water, saving that water, you know, um, you can do it. And maybe it would change your crop selection. But I think it's it's very very possible, and it's and it's what you know my grandfather probably used to do. Okay, um, so uh, this is another tactic. This is a kaolin clay. So it's a uh, a, a product you can buy. It is uh, food grade. Um, it uh, lessens the evapotranspiration of the plants, uh, the heat on the surface of the leaf. It also, when bugs climb on it, um, it agitates them, and all they want to do is clean themselves so they don't eat the plant. Okay. And we, uh, on a cold spring, if I'm trying to get my melons to sprout, that'll, that could be a problem. So it keeps the bugs off. This is the orchard. Um, now that the dust mulch, uh, uh, this is also this melon. So you can see, uh, compared to the, the Alice Chalmers Model G picture, the melons look a little wilted. Um, but they're so, the patch is so filled with melons that um, we take our shoes off and we tiptoe through the patch so we don't break the vines. And then we have to toss them out of the patch. So, um, and then the other picture is in the orchard. These are 20-year-old uh, peach trees, industry standard. It's you know 15 years and pull them out. I've got some trees in there that are 65 years old from the original orchard I took over, and uh, they just get better and better with age. Wow. Um, here are some of the melons we grow. Another nice thing, two things. Um, the orchard, because I have the dust mulch, it lowers the humidity in the orchard. I have no fungal issues. So I don't have to spray. There's nothing sprayed on this peach. And that's almost impossible to say about any peach you'd ever get in the supermarket. You are allowed to spray product up until the day of harvest on, um, you know, not every product, of course. But there's a lot of stuff you can put on food that none of you guys know about because we don't have to label it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, but, so these are all heirloom melons, super thin skin, super incredible flavor. But because I dry farm, I'm not wetting the soil. So things like wire worms don't come up from below me. So I am able to grow this stuff. All these other farmers see these melons, walk by them. They want to grow them. They try and grow them, and they fail. So, and it's because they don't dry farm. They don't believe in it, and that's the only reason. I, there's a, several people in Willow Creek with much better soil than me. So this is, um, we also, we, one of the ways we know how to pick a ripe melon is I make sure everybody eats out in the field as many as possible. <laughs> So just uh, some of the things, you know, we try and keep things flowering at all times on the farm. Uh, supporting your predators, uh, flowers, uh, every wasp is a, a, a friend and they need nectar at some stage in their life. So something flowering at all times. Um, this is a, a spring. This is not what you want to see as a peach farmer. But this also, this is where I live. This is just inland. And this is kind of why I live there. It'll get snow in the mountains, and then it's valley floor. We don't get it. There's snow. It's just that little bit. We're at 450 foot elevation, which isn't much, but you feel like you're way out there. And this is just a few weeks later. So as the trees leaf out. Um, this is another thing. Dry farming starts from the very first day you plant the tree. I am, this is a school field trip, and that tree is uh, eight inches tall. Uh, when you get a whip from the nursery, they usually stand about this big. Well, I bring it down, I look for those living buds, I cut it as low as I can, we're still getting at least two good shoots and two good directions. I prefer four shoots, but if I can only get two, I take them. So most of my trees, if you look in these pictures, as you go through the trees, you'll see that most of them have very short trunks. Also what that is, is it just means I don't need to do a riding lawnmower around them or anything like that, and I don't need a ladder that's two feet taller. You know, your workman's comp goes way up if your employees are on a 10-foot ladder. So I'd rather than pick a good amount of fruit right from the ground. So that's what that is. It's an Asian pear. Um, here's some Asian pears, too. Uh, 
super hard pruning, it's another tactic, uh, and then uh, good airflow, so you don't have to spray on the fungicide. Um, fruit thinning is Can huge. you explain this idea of cutting it down, and why do you do that? Um, well, I do it because the trunk is totally wasted space. Um, the whole tree can come down two feet if you just start your, your crotch lower on the tree. I, I would add that when they spray hose the um, plants every day in the nursery, they're growing a vascular system that assumes a certain amount of water and the dimensions of the pipes themselves inside the tree. You cut it down and you have a tree that has to regrow with the water balance that's there. Yeah. And you have an entirely different factor, it's just a different organism. Completely. Also, the, um, when you get uh, uh, any tree from a nursery, whether it's a pot or a uh, bare root, um, you're getting a tree that's been compromised. It's either been grown in a confined place or it's gotten its roots cut. Um, what I'm doing is I'm making sure, and for the rest of that tree's life, I'm making sure that its roots are bigger than the aerial portion of the tree. That thing is going to grow through disease, that thing is going to grow through insect attacks. If you keep the roots healthy and bigger than the rest of the tree, happy tree, happy bush, happy, you know, whether it's a pomegranate, whatever you're dealing with, it just, it goes right through. So, um, yeah, some just, it's, we like to, in the farming community, we call this farm porn. So, you guys are, this little my farm porn. I'm kind of proud of my farm porn. That is somebody here at the conference today. So uh, I had another one that my, my worker that helped me this morning cut out, uh, and uh, that's what you like to see, happy, satisfied. But, um, but I had another one that I gave a piece to this little kid about three weeks ago, and she started eating it, she had the same problem you guys did, the juice everywhere, right? And so, but she didn't stop eating it. She looked around and she saw there was a, a, a sewer uh, grate, and she, went over and ate her peach over the sewer <laughs> gate, and I was like, oh, my phone, oh, no, I'm just one of those guys. So yeah, it was great. That's the kind of flood irrigation. Yeah, totally. So, and this is another reason why the farm is, I, it's not feral, it's a very well-kept farm, but I love edges, and I love wilderness, even if it's, you know, a, this big around. Like, when you can have spots where this king snake, and I, that's a four-foot long king snake. It was amazing to watch it. And in the barn the other day, um, I actually saw it going down a mouse hole underneath the concrete slab. It was the coolest thing to see this entire snake go down a mouse hole. And I'll, I always, every time I saw that mouse hole, I'd always be like, oh, you know, step on it, fill it full of soil. Now I just let that mouse hole. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they do, which is amazing. So, this is once again, this is the heirloom tomatoes with the 30% shade cloth. Um, this is, these are some of the pictures. This is just the last few days harvesting pluot. You can see a lot of my neighbors around there mow three times a week. And it's crazy uh, because, you know, like I, the king snake, the pollinators, the everything that, it's just, it, I look at a lawn as, a, also growing up a suburban kid, like, it's a desert. It's like, so I, I mow as little as possible. And I, and I also stagger my mowing. So maybe one alleyway I'll mow while the other one's got dandelions and uh, uh, other things flowering. I also plant around the base of the trees where I'm not tilling or mowing uh, with uh, good flowers. Um, you know, like I said, this is my, these are some of my workers. That's our mobile chicken coop. Um, we tow it around uh, uh, about uh, 50 chickens in it. Um, and then this is, uh, this is us. We do... Uh, uh, community supported agriculture project. So we have a 65 member CSA, uh, and these are just, uh, this is a picture of us. That's just all the boxes that are empty, which is always nice to see. And then uh, lemon cukes, pluot, plums, some of the things that go into the box. That's it. So any questions about dry farming or? Yep, there's Karen down there. Karen. Not really a question, yeah, the, um, you know, things like apples, you can water an apple, and the only thing you're going to do is push the ripening date back. But if some things like tomatoes and peaches, if you water it, all you're going to get is a bigger peach. You're not going to get a more flavorful peach. You're just going to water it out. 
So it's, um, yeah. And so um, I, you know, I figured that out because of survival. I had to figure it out. Um, you know, the one niche I have is how do I beat the Safeway produce or how do I beat the raised market produce? I need, I need to have something for people to come back. And I can, I can look people in the eye and say thank you. I can do a lot of stuff to, um, to get people to come back. But if the produce, you know, it's a sympathy buy if it's, if the produce isn't good. So, why does some more people do it? Is it just that difficult to learn how to do it? No, well, you know, it's kind of like, you know, viticulture. If you're not educated at UC Davis or um, something like that, it's, it's, you know, we're all sheep. I'm watching, you know, all the hop growers out in, uh, in my area. They all have switched to, you know, four by four by four um, potting soil, you know, and it's amazing to me because I've farmed on some of those shaly sloped areas and I can dry farm melons. You know, and I'm like, man, if I can dry farm melons, you know, but they're all, it's all formulaic, and that's every farmer. And I, yeah, one of the things, I mean, check this out as you drive California, the Palouse in Washington, everywhere I've ever gone, you'll drive by a farmer's house, and rarely is there a garden. They're farmers because they, that's just what they are. It's not a love or a passion. There's a rule book you follow, and it's kind of why you get cookie cutter houses or anything else it's like it's you know I'm doing this because I love it if I was a home builder it'd be a custom home with you know zero net you know but uh, and that's you know I think that's why you're all here is because you care and uh, so I'm just I'm just a farmer that cares and uh, the situation I started out with was not ideal so and I turned it to my advantage turned my lack of water to my advantage is there a solution for um uh, just make sure it doesn't have a bottom, double dig it, um, add organic matter, and also a huge thing I've found is it can't just be potting soil in a uh, raised bed. It's got to be native soil. It can have some, you know, added amendments and some potting soil, but like what, what happens is uh, potting soil gets hy hydrophobic, mm -hmm. uh, so when it dries out or, you know, it's a different pH than the soil around it. It's, it's, so plants would rather just stay right there. You know, and then when it dries out, it's dried out. Mm -hmm. It's losing a lot. So if you can have a, a mainly native-based soil, I think that really helps with something like a raised bed. And then, uh, you know, no no liner in there or anything that would stop those roots. Because the big deal is, is another thing we do with our, our row crops, like our tomatoes and our melons, is I save all my own seed. It takes isolation. I bring them into my backyard where there's no other cucurbit or no other, you know, uh, uh, thing for it to cross, but I, I bring it into isolation so I can save my own seed, but I grow it under the same conditions, so no water. So that really enforces that deep, strong taproot nature of those plants, and that's the seed I plant out for the next you know, four years after that. Curious, how much, you know, you're farming, how much uh, you test the problems as far as uh, carrying your uh, values? Well, as an organic farmer, I know that I have to grow enough for everyone. So I, you know, I'm, I don't live in Eden, I've got plenty of pests, um, and I have to account for that. I also have a duty to, uh, to educate the public that um, maybe a perfect peach uh, isn't round, you know. So, um, so I used to do the Fortuna Farmer's Market for a long time, and man, you know, they're so used to buying that perfect peach, but it didn't taste like anything. So they would just scold me for my prices scold me for how bad everything looked. And then they and I would go home just I would feel so beat up coming home from that market. And it's a it's a long drive. And uh, and I'd count the money and I'd be like, damn it, I have to go back. And then that next week, that same old lady would be back cussing me out and telling me, <laughs> you know, but it was like we both this mutually dependent relationship. <laughs> yeah. Last one. Uh, we're in Willow Creek, so out Highway 299, about 45 minute drive from Arcata, um, and it's a tiny little mountain valley, and one of the beautiful things about it is there's very little arable land out there, and so there's probably six or eight farms that service the entire 100,000 uh, people population of the coastal Humboldt County with things like melons, peaches, and tomatoes. So I already have that advantage of being one of the few people with flat land out there. Right. Thank you all.
So um, hopefully you'll continue this revolution because you guys probably already know 80% of California's pumped water is taken to farms by irrigation and it's an absolute disaster. And we get bad food out of it. And we're learning the problem. Commissioner Garrett. 